Insert Ottoman ukulele has two parts, you see. You see. What's up, everybody? I'm the Hook, and I'm the Blade, and together we are, you know. Welcome to the Hook Blade Podcast, a show about all things Assassin's Creed. I'm your host Lawson, and with me, as always, is my co-host Tim. How are you doing today, Tim? Atrocious. Atrocious. <laughs> <laughs> that, what a great way to start the first episode yeah, yeah, yeah. of our podcast yeah, I, well look it, it, it only goes up from here that's true so which means that this recording of this episode is going to be the highlight of your day exactly so tim I, I guess the best way for us to get started here for people who are who are listening to this is to just sort of give a brief overview of like who we are in terms of our assassin's creed fandoms <laughs> you know yeah where did you sure. where did you kind of get started what was your first exposure to assassin's creed the biggest Assassin's Creed memory I have of starting off was going to the Assassin's Creed Revelations midnight launch at my local GameStop. Damn, that's old school. With man. three other people. It was a lot of fun. Dude, you had friends in high school? No, no, no I'm saying I, I went there, <laughs> oh, there and were there three were other three people other there. people. Um, I did not mean to put you on blast like that this early <laughs> in the podcast. Too. No, yeah, um, even if I did have friends, they wouldn't have gone with me. <laughs> Um, I came a little later to the game. My parents got me Assassin's Creed when I was probably like the first game when I was like 12. So it was still a few years right. after. And I remember everyone being really excited for Assassin's Creed 3. And I wanted to play it because everyone else in seventh grade wanted to play it. But I had to wait until I would played the other games. So I waited. And then once Black Flag came around, I really had to jump on board. So I played them all. And that's the same year, 2013, that I joined the subreddit. So it's been a long time, uh, us being Assassin's Creed fans. Once the hype was really building up for Unity and Rogue, um, I started the Assassin's Creed Marathon. Um, so you might see uh, some of those posts every year. It's kind of like this advent calendar type event where we count down to the new Assassin's Creed game by playing levels and sequences of the old ones. Um I worked on a couple of Assassin's Creed podcasts a few years ago. There was the Animus Island podcast that I was uh, sort of like a contributor to. Um, and then there was the Bureau podcast. I was a host of that, and you were one of our contributors on that podcast as well. So that's kind of how we know each other. That was mm -hmm. a good four or five years ago now, right? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I remember I first found out about you through Animus Island because you were doing the music for that, as you mentioned. Yeah. And then the Bureau was kind of forming at that time and i was kind of a part of that and then and then the rest is history essentially in a lot of ways us doing this podcast right now and talking about these things this is kind of us coming out of an assassin's creed fan hibernation would you agree absolutely for i think both of us valhalla is maybe the most exciting assassin's creed game in a long time yeah, for sure. It's been a while. For those of us who are kind of fans of the more classic style of Assassin's Creed, it, it was hard to kind of get excited for games like Origins and Odyssey. But Valhalla is, is they're making the right moves. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean... They're, they're saying the right things. They, they, they know what we want to hear. I haven't been this excited about an Assassin's Creed since probably Unity. Yeah, I... I can't say this compares to my Unity hype. My Unity hype was through the roof. I was really excited for that setting and that next-gen gameplay, next-generation Arno, all of it, man. Um, and when it wouldn't run on my gaming PC, I like I cried real tears <laughs> that day. I really did. <laughs> so, so this isn't this isn't quite Unity hype for me, but I'm glad that it's Unity hype for you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, and, and Unity hype for me was pretty fucking severe just because, <laughs> like, it, I don't know, I was I was starting to get old enough to, like, theorize about things. Because, I mean, I mean, we were both pretty youngins when we first started playing. Yeah, we're talking, I mean, for those, I mean, yeah, it's probably important to note here. When we're talking about Unity and we're talking about me crying, we're talking about, <laughs> like, 14. Yeah, you're we're not 14 year old. <laughs> <laughs> you're not 30 years old you're not 30 years old and crying <laughs> over that yeah i mean yeah uh let's just see, 20... in case that wasn't clear <laughs> I, 2014 so i was i was what like 15 years old yeah when when unity came out so that was i was officially able to navigate a computer yeah i was i was I, 15 when Unity like, came out yeah so i was like going on the forums <laughs> and i hated it and that's how i eventually got to the subreddit so damn we're, we're putting the forums on blast in episode one Oh, okay, no, sorry, I loved it. Let's let's not post this episode to the forums. <laughs> I loved it. Then. I loved it. I loved it. It was great. We love the forums. We love the forums. <laughs> yeah, we love yeah. the subreddit. No, no, the, the, the 
<laughs> the people there are fine. The people there are fine. I just didn't like the interface. <laughs> okay, all right. That makes more sense. Forum interfaces are like are like stepping into the year 2007 <laughs> through a time machine. <laughs> um, but speaking of the subreddit, I'm also really excited about being a moderator now. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, Cause a lot of uh, the people who moderate the subreddit and have moderated it for years are really good friends of mine. So I just kind of felt like once they were looking for some new hands that uh, it was time to, it was time to take my relationship with the subreddit to the next <laughs> level. You know what I mean? Yeah. When a man loves a subreddit. When a... <laughs> exactly. You get it. Yeah, I get it. I get it. <laughs> so really what this episode is all about besides introducing ourselves to you is just sort of summarizing what we know about Assassin's Creed Valhalla, talking about the things that have us really excited, the things that we're looking forward to, and things that we're maybe theorizing or hoping for, because it, it really is pretty early days. There are a lot of things we know, but there's a lot more that we don't know. For sure. I think once we get a, a gameplay demo, we'll start to have a better feel of what we're really in for, but we're going to be waiting till like July for that demo. Yeah. I mean, I feel like a lot of the information, while I and happy we are getting it. A lot of it poses more questions than it answers right it now. It totally does. I mean, Darby McDevitt, the writer of this game, who we're, mm -hmm. gonna, who we were definitely going to talk about because if you don't know, Darby McDevitt was the lead writer on Assassin's Creed Revelations and Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Uh, two real highlights in the series, as far as we're concerned, at least. And yeah. I think it's probably most fans like those games. Um, <clears throat> so having him back on board to tell the story is a really encouraging sign because it's been a long time. I mean, the last game he wrote on was for Assassin's Creed was Black Flag. So, um, but but he's been on Twitter being very cryptic about some details of the game. Like, you know, everyone's talking about Eivor, the gender options, and he's like, both are canon somehow. Yeah, we'll have to whatever figure that it out. means. <laughs> I have no idea what that could possibly mean. Yeah, I don't know. Because with, with Darby, nothing's ever simple. No, he, so he likes like, to play with us. He likes to mess with our heads. Right. I mean, so your first assumption is probably not correct. Right. Also, the director of this game, I'm sure everybody listening to this knows this by now, Ashraf Ismail, who's best known for Black Flag and Origins. So... Really, I mean, this is the first time the Black Flag team has completely reunited. And I don't mean team. I mean, everyone that works in these games is important. But definitely yeah. your your creative director and your narrative lead are setting a, a pretty big tone and standard for the entire game. So for it's sure. really encouraging to see them back. And we just found out recently that the legendary composer, Jesper Kaid. Is that how you say it? Is it Jesper Kaid or I, Kid? I used to say Jesper, like... And I, and I feel like that is the uncultured way to say it. I Jesper? Like no, I'm not asking if, about how Jesper is pronounced, but Kaid, though. Oh. <laughs> is it Kaid or Kid? Uh, how uh, I how else was... would you pronounce Jesper, Tim? Y y Jesper? Really? With, with the J, yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Hey, look, Where is he from? Um, <laughs> no, Kid. I would say Kid, though, right? You'd say Kid? I always used to say Kid. Jesper Kid. I want to say Kaid, though. I'm Googling it. When you type how is Jesper Kide uh into Google before you say pronounced, the suggestion is doing. <laughs> <laughs> How's Jesper doing? <laughs> Jesper, if you're if you're listening, Google wants to know how you're doing. Um but he did tweet that it's pronounced kid, so we know that I've been Woo! wrong. You were right. Jesper Kid. Jesper Kid and Sarah Schockner. Sarah just did the Origins soundtrack recently, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like the blending of old school and new school in the composer's world. Cause Jesper's last soundtrack was revelations. Yeah. Really. I think mixing old school and new school is kind of the, the, the modus operandi of Valhalla. The way that they've been talking about it is that they've been saying that a lot of things that are important to classic Assassin's Creed fans like you and me are going to be kind of coming back into the fold. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it really seems like they're pulling out all the stops here. Yeah. The decision to bring back Jesper at least seems like a pretty big signal to those of us who have been playing these games since the very beginning that like, OK, shit's getting real. They're 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 doing it. Yeah. Um, so I'm just kind of going through a list. There's a there's sort of a batch of recent details that have come out of uh, at Access the Animus. One thing that they've confirmed is that there are going to be three gameplay archetypes, um, just like how in Odyssey there was the assassin, the warrior and the hunter. Mm hmm. Um, so they're they're doing three, but we don't know if it's the same three. They're trying to make the skill tree a little bit more 
granular than just a selection of skills. So it's maybe going to be smaller um, stakes things like like I don't know stat boosts and and tinier I guess controls over over your gameplay abilities than full on like press this button to break people's shields and set your sword on fire for 15 seconds and turn invisible and stuff like that. Right. They're going to kind of the way that they're doing the long boat in this game, which apparently is called the Drakkar or Drakkar, Drakkar. I don't know. I'm going to say Drakkar. Um, it is something you can call the same way you'd call a horse. They're kind of using it like a horse in the sense that there's going to be this river system through England that you can navigate with the longboat. You can have it follow the river automatically if you want to, um, and that you can bring your Viking buddies with you to places. Yeah, it seems like uh, if you, uh, not to, uh, it, it seems like in that uh, little gameplay, like really short trailer we got, yeah. um, Eivor like uh, used a horn. Yeah. And that, that and my, my first thought was that was like during a raid and that was what you would do to like signal the start of a raid, but maybe that's calling the boat. Maybe. I think you're probably right about the raid thing though. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's my first instinct, but if you're going to call the boat, I feel like it could be cool if you like use the horn. I don't know. I think it's kind of weird. I I don't want to get too mired on this one detail, but like when you call the ship in Odyssey or in other games when you're like calling your whole ship, they'll like pass time a little bit so that you can at least pretend it took the ship like a few minutes to get there. Right. Yeah. Unlike your horse, which your horse just spawns 20 feet behind you. And it's like, oh, <laughs> there he is now. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if the longboat is going to be like the horse or the ship. Like is the ship full of my Viking friends just going to appear 20 feet behind me on the river? <laughs> is there a passage of time? I don't know. We'll find out. Um, so the one thing that's interesting is that, so Darby McDevitt has talked about there being a unique story structure in this game. Right. And maybe one of the first hints of what that really means is the idea that the story is built around these big questing arcs that all tend to start and end at your settlement. So there's supposed to be this rhythm of, you know, you're in your settlement, the settlement is your home base, but you have to leave to, to accomplish things. You have to leave to raid, to get s supplies and to do things for your settlement. Right. And that seems like one of the more interesting ways that they're going to be taking the story. I don't know, though, like when Darby says there's a story structure to this game that has not been seen in any video game before, that gets me pretty torqued. You know what I mean? Well, um, I mean, that that has me excited. I'm not sure, like, because also, I mean, you have the uh, we do know that romance options can be used to uh, like win over allegiances. Yeah. Which so is perhaps, a great yeah, idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well. It's a great way to use romances instead of just fucking people. <laughs> instead of just like, like, like cutting to black and then, oh, right, that was yeah. fun, wasn't it? Yeah, because I could see like, okay, so you have like a conscious decision. Do I want to go with this person or that person? Because this person can help me in this way and that person can help yeah. me in that way. That could lead back to your settlement. Like either yeah. you could get more supplies for this part of your settlement. Like I'm not too sure how in-depth the settlement is mechanic is going to be but it, it, it does seem like seems like pretty big part of the story the yeah gameplay. for sure yeah so probably like there are different ways you could benefit your settlement um and going with certain people in the world could benefit your settlement in different ways perhaps yeah i think what that's speaking to as well is this idea of like let's take some of the gameplay systems that are around in origins and odyssey and just give them more purpose and, right. and not have these things be kind of arbitrary or not feel as connected to everything the, a lot of the things that they're describing as far as changes that they're making for this game are things that strike me as like really focusing um, on, on a particular experience. They've talked about how the world is smaller and it's more detailed. It's less like this big world with every like randomly generated fort or whatever it feels right. like. And that the experience you're supposed to have from stealth to combat to parkour is supposed to be more sort of meticulously handcrafted in each area to give you an experience as a player. Absolutely. And I mean, that is something like that. that that's a big reason why I'm very excited is just because the idea that like you don't just have this huge map. And yeah, uh, while well, while it's big in size, it's very little and, and impactful things to do in it. Yeah, and since they're, um, I think the fact that they're even treating that as a selling point, which it is, it, right. it signals a shift in what their priorities are because absolutely. most Assassin's Creed games, you probably have corporate saying, 
Well, can we get the map a little bigger than last time? <laughs> Just so we can say it's the biggest map. Yeah. We yeah, want the I trailers mean, to say it's the biggest map. That was such a, like, I, I remember, like, in, like, Black Flag and Unity days, like, Unity being the size of all of Black Flag's maps put together was a really big deal. Yeah, and, and now when you go back to Unity and you play it, like, it's a big city, but it doesn't feel as big. Like, it, it doesn't feel very big at all compared to when you have Origins and Odyssey, these massive expanses of land. Uh, right. So, yeah, really, it seems like the over under on, on all of this is that they're trying to kind of hone in on the experience of the game, which is really important. I mean, so one of the things they've talked about along those lines is kind of changing, overhauling the leveling system to where there won't be like player levels and enemy levels necessarily. It's more about the gear you have and the skills you have and Absolutely. how that kind of prepares you for the uh, the world around you. And also the fact following on from that that insta kill hidden blade is back yeah <laughs> which we never thought we'd have to celebrate but here exactly. we are yeah for sure i, I mean it, yeah it's honestly really interesting to be like wait a second so i can like actually use the hidden blade effectively again yeah yeah but i'm so glad too because in everything about odyssey obviously it's a controversial game people especially in the subreddit tend to be split one way or the other i tend to i enjoy odyssey even if i don't love what it is in regards to an Assassin's Creed game. But the biggest complaint I have, like the one thing I will absolutely condemn, like this is bad and no one should like this, is the fact that like you can be in a fort and see an enemy like four levels below you. And if they're just a big guy, you can't one hit kill them with, an, with a hidden blade at all. Yeah, it definitely like, it, it kind of defeats the purpose of even like, trying to stealth because most of the time it's yeah. gonna be like here's combat and oh yeah and even on this recent playthrough i did of odyssey um i specced as much into stealth as i could and there are still probably you know 25 to 30 percent of the forts and locations that i would try to do a perfect stealth run through of uh i would get into open combat purely out of necessity because there was no other way um, right. And then you just hope you can kill them quickly so that no one else comes to help them out. Yeah, and I mean, and that's a big thing for me with this game is as long as I can, like, feel like I'm getting a a whole experience without having to, like, grind and deck out an entire skill tree, yeah. then I'm happy. And it seems like that's not the case because there isn't, and there isn't a leveling system akin to uh, Odyssey. So yeah. I'm happy about that. And they know that people's like if you read the reviews of the of, of Odyssey, the biggest complaint in the reviews is the grind. Is how often right. you have to step away from the main story to go do side missions because you're too underleveled. And this playthrough I did, I had the XP booster because you know I did the Project Stream thing. They gave you like ten dollars of currency. I bought the XP booster because I didn't want to screw around with it. And even with the XP booster, there does come at least two points in the main story where you won't be fully leveled to play the right. next mission for sure so the next thing that kind of that um that valhalla does that kind of focuses a, a little bit that i think is really interesting uh that we also learned in this access the animus info dump is that they're kind of trying to make the settlement this very like immersive simulator like place to live i think they're maybe taking some cues out of the red dead redemption 2 playbook here you know you can talk to your war chief about what you're doing you can check on the other inhabitants who will mostly be characters in the game. You can interact with things. You can lay down in your bed. You can go to sleep. You can fish. You can go fishing. Finally, yeah, Assassin's Creed that, fishing. Finally, honestly. I'm going to tell you this right now, Timothy, and you don't know this about me. I'm a slut for fishing mini games. Really? Yeah, like Stardew Valley, all fishing all the time. Uh, wow. Back in Toontown, what was I doing? I was fishing. <laughs> do, I, do I ever want to go fishing in real life? No. No, not even a little bit. Not, I have no interest. It's, it's, it's not very fun in but, real life. But fishing mini games are always bangers, except for Red Dead Redemption Two. I hate that one. It's not good. No, it's really bad. Mm. I spent like literally a whole, I want to say twenty five minutes on this one fish for a mission. Literally just trying <laughs> to reel it in. Just trying to reel it in. It took twenty five minutes. I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> wow. I've never hated myself more for a choice I made in a video game. <laughs> Yeah, so that's my that to me out of all these like things you can do in your settlement, the fishing is the most exciting. I gotta say, definitely, I agree. Again, good fishing mini game. I am here for it. Um, yeah, I'll pre-order just for that. Yeah. So like other 
kind of details that are important. Um, you know, story-wise, the setting, we're talking 873 AD Europe. And you're mm-hmm. going to be kind of going from Norway to England. Um, and it seems like I've heard that, I don't know if everyone knows this yet. I've heard that Norway is not necessarily a location on the map, but it's kind of a place like Versailles in Unity that you can fast travel to as needed. Right. Or like, or like uh, Cappadocia in Revelations. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like you can go there if you need to, um, but it's not part of the main map. And there are also locations that are supposed to be in the game that we don't know yet. There's supposed to be like three or four places and some of them are surprises. Interesting. I'm sure someone who has a better understanding of history and geography than uh, we do could throw out like some obvious like examples of where else we would go. But unfortunately, we're not those kinds of podcast hosts. No. Also, the thing I was going to mention about the insta kill hidden blade is it's going to be kind of a rhythm game. Like the if you try to insta kill an enemy that's really high level, there might be like an unplayably hard <laughs> like rhythm tapping game like lock picking yeah. goes yeah like, yeah yeah like the lock pick i'm i'm cautious about that but Me too. i can't make an i can't have an opinion on that until we see it in action in july it, yeah, i mean it, it just it definitely seems it definitely seems like like like, like, a, like a compromise between the two systems yeah like you want to be able to have there be places you can't just brute force through stealth and i get that like if i could just go to the hardest place in the world and and stealth it out I think that should be possible personally. I do. Yeah. Cause but, I mean, but the even, risk of getting into open combat would just be greater and it would just be exactly. more challenging. Yeah. But I, yeah. So things like this with the critical assassinate stuff feels like arbitrary gating, but we're again, we don't know. We're going to have to see in Valhalla how it goes. Right. Yeah. You can mount wolves as, as to, as a vehicle, apparently. I don't, I, I mean, don't, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I'm not a wolf expert, but I don't know if there are wolves big enough that you could mount. Avor can I'm wrong about that. contain animals, including bears. Eagle vision is called Odin sight, but you have a raven instead of an eagle. They say parkour throughout the world will be meaningful and rewarding. I have no idea what that means, but I'm excited about it. Yeah, I mean, it honestly just could be be, be like a return to like tomb type missions. Yeah. And that would be cool. Which I, which I, yeah, I'm a hundred percent down. Parkour is one of the things that I love most about this franchise. So seeing it done well again would be amazing. Origins and Odyssey were real letdowns in the parkour department. Um, I mean, just, just giving you areas that are fun to climb would be, I mean, like it's just, I feel like climbing is taking such a backseat, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like it just doesn't feel like the game doesn't encourage it anymore the way it used to. Right. Something that I think is interesting is they've talked about how the dialogue choices system from Odyssey is returning. The idea is that they want Eivor to be a focused character with a personality. So the options that you're going to get are going to be in line with that personality. It's not going to be like you can choose your personality the kind of way it is in Odyssey. Yeah, it's you're you're not you're not just like a blank slate essentially. Like Eivor is a character that would do certain things. Yeah. So I feel like your your dialogue choices aren't going to be absurd and radical you know they're going to be something that avor could potentially say you have a hood toggle in game which we don't know yet if that's tied to like a stealth mode like a crouch the way that i think syndicate kind of did it yes yeah syndicate did it that way but being able to just toggle the hood we like that it's fun there are like five kinds of gear that you can collect in the world and every piece of gear that you collect will be unique so you won't be getting like 50 versions of the same Mystheos hood or, or mercenary armor or whatever in Odyssey was. Right. And I think it is worth mentioning too, that you can essentially st- complete the entire game with the gear that you start with. Yeah. And you can do transmog as well, which, you know, means that you are able to kind of customize the look of your gear without sacrificing the stats, which is, it should be in every game because yeah, I don't want my character to look like a goofball just because the best armor in the game has looks like a goofball. <clears throat> yeah, because as as you upgrade the uh, the gear, apparently it'll change it'll change appearance, but you can go back to the original appearance if you want to. I'm really excited about throwing axes. Yeah, I mean it, it does it does. I mean I'm just the sheer um, the sheer like amount of weapons and stuff like really reminds me of like the jump from AC one to AC two. 
where you yeah. had like spears and axes you could use. It's just I I like having a lot of uh, options in terms of weapons. I don't remember where I heard this, but I I've heard that there's a skill you can unlock at a certain point in the game that will let you use a two handed weapon in one hand. Yeah, that was from the Washington Post stream that just happened. So you can technically like I think you could you could hold a spear in one hand. What I want to know is. Is that stackable with the crazy dual wielding system? Can I dual wield spears? Two spears? Yeah, that I sounds mean, cool. They seem like they're like they, they seem really happy that you can dual wield the shields. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like they're gonna I, go yeah. ridiculous with the dual wielding, and I'm I'm here for that. Exactly. They are kind of continuing the modern day story of Origins and Odyssey, which mm-hmm. I have mixed to negative. Well, okay, we'll say negative feelings about, <laughs> but um, but we're gonna kind of get into that maybe in another episode here in the, on the horizon. Um, right. And here's one thing that I always feel like is a signifier of a good Assassin's Creed game: bringing back traditional loading screen, memory corridor, white room situation. Yes. When you do that, that's I think specifically when they do it after not doing it, like, cause not every game with a memory corridor is great, but every time they get rid of the memory corridor, uh, I, I feel personally betrayed. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's such a simple thing. It's like, it feels but... like a deliberate choice to just be different. Yeah. Like Odyssey is like, we can't, we, it wasn't enough to take away your hidden blade. We have to take away your memory corridor too. Yeah, it also wasn't enough to take away like everything enjoyable. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we have we have some between the two of us. We have some di- mixed opinions about Odyssey, but I will say this: I enjoy it. It's fun. It's a fun game. Yeah. I like playing it. Um, you're you're allowed to think that sea shanties are implied to be returning, but I don't know. Would you just hear them in your longboat? Is everyone I mean, just singing they, on they, a longboat? Also, I mean, also done this. Sorry, go ahead. no, you. Uh, well, they've, they've also, like, said that there are Viking rap battles. Yeah, flighting. Whatever that's about. So that may, perhaps that could be a shanty type deal. Like, those songs are shanties, maybe? Well, it's, it wouldn't be songs. Really, what flighting is supposed to be. I mean, yeah, that, like, colloquially, we can call it a rap battle. But I think the idea is more like spoken word arguments. <laughs> it's oh, like, okay. Under, yeah, it's yeah. like, I, <laughs> yeah, you're trying to be clever and funny the way you would in a rap battle. But there's not necessarily music going on, I don't think. Um, and something that was interesting about it that someone said, I think Ashraf said on the, on the Washington post stream is that like Eivor is kind of a poetic person. Like that's something that might appeal to them, the flighting because they are, they're, they're, they care about words and and poetry. Eivor is apparently, you know, he's got a sense of humor. He's stoic, but not, you're right. Uh, yeah, they have the sense of humor, but yeah. they're uh, you know, but they're stoic, but not too stoic. Yeah. And, and so there's a lot of personality things going around here that I think could make Avor a very interesting character. Can I also just say, really glad that they decided that even though it's male or female, they have the same character name, so that I don't have to be called the Eagle Bearer for the whole game. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They can just record Avor. They can just say Avor. <laughs> I don't think they've gotten enough credit for that yet. So I yeah, for sure. No, I think it's a uh, great choice, honestly. I was laughing my ass off the other day because I was playing Odyssey and I was playing as Cassandra and she's talking to this character and, and she's like, oh, the, the eagle better. And then Cassandra's like, oh, call me Cassandra. And then for the rest of that storyline, they never say her name. <laughs> so really, at the end of the day, what we're expecting out of Valhalla is taking the ingredients of gameplay that were introduced by Origins and, and changed a little bit in Odyssey and putting them towards a more like focused, smaller, cohesive experience, right? That's kind of the yeah. gist I'm getting from all of this. Yeah, I mean, and I think, I think with Darby at the helm and Ashraf, I mean, they're definitely a team that can really focus on what makes that game in particular special. Yeah, and so I don't think they're going to be worried about doing a bunch of new things. I think they're just going to be able to really just. Uh, sit down and just hone in on very specific things and do them very well. This game is interesting because it both feels like in some ways other, uh, you know, contrary to games like Origins Odyssey or, or really any of the main pillar games for the last five, six, seven years, this doesn't seem to have the big like headline feature changes or dramatic shakeups like some of the other games have had in the past. It's really more about like 
owning that this is an iteration. This is a cousin of the the games that that have at least come out previously and just saying we're going to take all of the things that we've introduced all of the big ideas of origins and odyssey on a gameplay level and just say concentrate it grind it down boil it down to its its essence and just deliver that in the best possible way again we're making a lot of assumptions here we don't know what the game really looks like yet we contrary to ubisoft's belief have not seen a gameplay trailer yeah, which is which is because uh, to me the cinematic trailer was not that excellent. I don't know. You know, it's kind of it's kind of grown on me a little bit in the in the terms of like I, I don't know what else I would have expected from the cinematic trailer. You but know what we, I mean? Like, we, but we've had such great cinematic trailers though. Like, even, like yeah. even the Origins trailer is 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 awesome. Is it? Is it? I so? like it. I don't like it that much. <laughs> I mean, I like the like uh, Leonard Cohen. I mean, well, you think Unity Cinematic Trailer is the best. So, I well, do. Um, it is the best. Yeah, I think the Revelations Cinematic Trailer would have a word. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, Valhalla, it's exciting. It has brought us out of uh, Assassin's Creed retirement. We're basically doing this podcast because the excitement for Valhalla has made us feel like we have to be doing some Assassin's Creed stuff. We have to be doing projects. Hopefully, the more that we see and the more that we learn about Valhalla, that excitement increases. I would hate for the gameplay to come around and then let's be like, oh. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, Hookblade but, podcast abruptly canceled after gameplay demo. <laughs> right. I mean, but, you know, I mean, I, I'm i very optimistic about it. I, I think that gameplay was going to, is going to knock our socks off. I think it's going to, it's going to, it's going to, that, it's going to knock our socks off. <laughs> <laughs> i'm excited you're excited um really that's been it for our first episode thank you so much for listening i've been the hook fuck no i'm the blade shit yeah that's right i've i've been the hook you're the hook i'm the blade these titles don't mean anything we just thought this would be a funny name for our (laughs) podcast i don't know i it's an elegant name i think people would consider me very hooky you're i'm kind of a blade too i mean i'm I'm pretty stab like in my personality. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're the you're the hook that gets people into the podcast and then I'm the blade that comes through and kills them. Kills them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah. <laughs> Thank you for, for listening and we Thank will see you, you next time. In. See you next time on the Hook Blade Podcast. hook and the blade so you can use one or the other an elegant design 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 design